Thank you. Um, when we decided to do this talk, we said, hey, DevSecOps, why not have three people talking, representing DevSecOps? So uh, that's where we are. Uh, we have uh, basically it's my team here talking uh, about what we did at Neiman Marcus. It's more of a real world example. Uh, and it's, we're focused on actually uh, implementing DevSecOps in our organization, and uh, we chose uh, to implement it in our serverless world. Uh, so a lot of things you heard today, we're talking about how uh, different uh, organizations are looking at security, and uh, yes, there's a lot of things to be solved in the security realm, uh, and as we go uh, towards the cloud, uh, we chose to do DevSecOps, not with a lot of the existing uh, uh, applications and infrastructure out there, but more in the serverless world. So this is a very opinionated talk on how we actually implemented DevSecOps, uh, very related to AWS Cloud, and so uh, I want to kind of share uh, what we've done. So most folks, most organizations have heard CICD, it solves world peace, almost, right? Uh, so, uh, but then they are running into a lot of uh, legacy apps or uh, on-prem uh, and uh, very traditional processes. They're trying to, uh, they go to a conference, they hear CICD, they hear, oh, all the FANG companies that do thousands of deployments a day in production. And they come back and say, okay, why can't we do it? And then they try to force fit uh, some of that uh, uh, my uh, existing mindset and try to still enable CI/CD. Then, as you see from that graph, you hear all this hype, and then you hit the uh, disillusionment phase, where we said, "Hey, we implemented microservices, we implemented containers. Why can't we do CI/CD? Or when we do CI/CD, we violate this uh, principle, or we have a security hole, right?" So uh, that's, you know, we, they still do a monolithic uh, release with a release ceremony, take your 20 microservices, but still release as one, right? So a lot of those practices uh, kind of lead to that disil disillusionment, right? Uh, security is still in most large enterprises very traditional, very reactive, uh, coming up at the end, right? Just prior to go live, have you done a scan? Right, and then you fail the scan, then you go back, right? So a lot of the uh, taking a traditional mindset of what has been done in the last 40, 50 years in security and trying to apply that in the serverless world, it kind of leads to a lot of the dis dis disillusionment. So what we've done is primarily to for DevSecOps to be successful in our organization at least, and we think uh, in most enterprises, the three most important things are organization and culture, right? It's very important. People still play a, a vital part in any implementation of DevSecOps because as a lot of speakers before mentioned, it's not just the tools and the technology. They help you, but it's still people, right? So how do you organize uh, that, those set of people in the right set, in the right mechanism, so that we enable uh, that agility that we need, right? Architecture, right? You can't, as I said earlier, architecture is also a very important part of enabling DevSecOps. You can't take a mainframe and say, I want to do DevSecOps on mainframe. You just can't. Uh, so those are things, the right architecture is also important on en enabling uh, DevSecOps. And then, of course, the tools and the pipeline uh, are very critical in trying to help accelerate that journey. When it comes to organization, what that fundamentally means is security is everybody's responsibility, right? Rather than just having a, a silo of a security team, now you're saying and embedding that role within product teams. So one of the most important things for DevSecOps to work is organizing yourself as product teams, and that product teams involves security role. And then everybody's, it's a shared responsibility at that point, right? Uh, we can do uh, responsibility, but you also have to have accountability. That means the security uh, accountability also goes to that product team. 
uh, we have we can have governance and other things outside, but the core accountability for security also partly rests with that same product team. And then the, another very good principle that we follow is the trust but verify uh, policy, right? So uh, you tr empower development teams and product teams to go af as fast, get some parameters uh, around them, guardrails around them, but also verify that they are doing this. We do that using git pull requests, right? There's still that element to validate what they say they're doing. Then uh, one of the next things, I'm, uh, important pillars that I mentioned was also uh, the architecture. As I said, you can't fit a square peg in a round hole. Don't try to do so DevSecOps with mainframe or legacy apps. You will fail, right? Uh, again, as I said, it's opinionated, so uh, please bear with that. But it, it is a uh, what we've learned for the hard way is you you can do a lot of the DevSecOps only with modern technologies in the cloud, and it's very difficult to try to do that uh, with legacy apps or legacy processes, right? Serverless, uh, I don't know how much of you have started uh, developing, but it's a total paradigm shift, right? Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, teams to, uh, earlier talking about how cloud takes away the basic uh, infrastructure responsibility, right? With serverless, you're even taking more away, right? You, you, you're actually just deploying code. So a lot of that security responsibility uh, now falls. It all driv is driven towards the app, and that's what we call shift left. In this case, means everything is app security becomes your as um, if not more important than any system security, right? Because your cloud provider uh, taking care of everything else uh, below the uh, in a serverless world, right? And why we chose serverless from an architecture perspective is to implement DevSecOps is inherently serverless is decomposed into a smallest unit possible and that automatically restricts your blast radius. Unlike in a monolithic app, you have a gigantic app with a single deployment, right? And the reason you have security issues or you have build failures, or you can't implement DevSecOps is because you a small change impacts something else or breaks some other thing. Inherently, serverless decomposes the app into multiple microservices so that automatically restricts the blast radius. There's always going to be issues, right? But the, you want to restrict your blast radius so that it doesn't take out the entire app. Mistakes do happen, but uh, how do you uh, put guardrails around uh, those mistakes is uh, serverless greatly enables that. Um, pipeline and tools. So as I said earlier, the third pillar for DevSecOps is your pipeline and tools. And now your CISO's best friend is your pipeline because uh, pipeline is one m way for DevSecOps teams to help ensure the organization's policies actually being implemented, right? And that gives you the consistency across the enterprise as different product teams are doing it. How do you enable and empower product teams to go as fast as they ca can, but at the same time, putting some guardrails and best practices and policies that's using the pipeline and that should be your single source of truth on how uh, things are actually set up and working. So to get into more details on how uh, uh, the architecture and uh, how things are actually working, uh, I turn it over to Clay Danford, uh, who'll be talking a little bit more on that. Great, thank you so much, Hamid. So I did make the comment before coming up here, we don't have nearly enough memes in our presentation, so I apologize for that. But um, hopefully we can uh, you know, still keep it interesting. So I had to call out just this one slide. You know, it's already been talked about before, shifting left. And this is a very traditional uh, you know, workflow, local development testing all the way through to build artifacts, deployments. And then usually at the end, you have a, a very traditional security pen testing uh, kind of mechanism. Well, with shifting left and with serverless deployments, we're, we're really working more with our developers to have a much more security focus um, start from the very left on local development and testing. And uh, I actually put a lot of emphasis on the testing component. So uh, good unit tests, local tests before even getting it into the environment certainly is going to help with a, uh, a lot of uh, finding vulnerabilities or, or making sure that event payloads are, are correct and you can't, um, uh, you can't uh, 
fake payloads and put malicious um, uh, content in, into the uh, serverless application. So I just wanted to call that one out. Um, but sp serverless specific security, as Hamath mentioned, uh, is yet another abstraction on top of what we're used to th through cloud. And uh, traditionally, over time, we've moved from bare metal to virtual machines, then to containers, and now serverless, which is a lot of functions, static web pages, um, DynamoDB uh, for database. And just by definition, there's much less to manage. So there's um, the infrastructure components and the size of that shrinks considerably, which is great because you have less that you have to worry about from a security perspective on an infrastructure layer and more towards around how the application itself is architected and any vulnerabilities there. So container instance management is uh, abstracted from you. There's no need for patching, for scaling. A lot of these services have auto scaling. The, it moves from a system-based security, again, to an app-based security. And we're mostly focused on the code, the integration, and the distributed resources that uh, come along with that. So as you distribute services out, it means that you have many more entry points in your applications. So you have more that you have to secure from that component with APIs, but you also have a much smaller blast radius. So with a, a service, per se, you might have something that is, like Amos said, a, a very small unit of, um, of an application. And uh, if that is compromised, then of course only that component is, is compromised in that, um, in that application, assuming you know, there's no, no pivot points from there. And, uh, there's actually a really great white paper that I highly suggest that you go check out from a company called PureSec. And they did an analysis on the top 10, uh, on the top 10 um, vulnerabilities and uh, components that you need to secure in a serverless uh, application. And it goes into a lot of detail. It's a great read. I highly suggest you check it out. And I'm just going to touch over just a couple components here today. Uh, but really, I, I highly suggest you check that out. So. Um, so some of the nuts and bolts that we use internally. Specifically, for our serverless deployments, we use a tooling called Serverless Framework, which is another abstraction on top of CloudFormation, but it enables developers to quickly get code into an account and deployed into account. So on the back end, we do have build, um, Jenkins to build and deploy, but it's very simple to copy some YAML and to get some, a standard repo with some standard tags and things down onto your um, laptop and start adding functions, start adding APIs and, and a, um, capability, and it'll package up the code for you and deploy it automatically. And with that, there's a whole slew of plugins and things that you can add, some for security and whatnot. And uh, PureSec actually has a great plugin which will, you can run and will find the least privilege that your application and your service needs on that specific deployment. So you can tailor your functions down to least privilege. Of course, uh, typical security scanning in CI, CD, and then of course, solid local testing. So one of those components that PureSec actually talks about is validating your events and validating your configuration and using proper testing locally to really nip those security uh, vulnerabilities in the bud before they even get into an account. Um, <clears throat> then here's just an example of a YAML file. You know, just this could actually really quickly spin up a whole ton of resources behind the scenes and get uh, code into an AWS account. It also is for GCP and uh, Azure too. So if that's what you, you run, you can do that too. Uh, so again, least privilege. We do function-specific privilege in, for our services. That means that if you have a function that makes a call to a DynamoDB table, we only give it the necessary privileges that it needs uh, to make that call. Uh, there's also the, the PureSec serverless plugin, which can help uh, tailor down those IAM permissions. And this is really critical as it enables us to uh, really keep a laser focus on what is actually needed in, um, for a function and for a service to work. Of course, proper configuration through throttling and right sizing, those are big ones, those are huge, because we certainly don't want resource exhaustion. That is a thing that happens in the cloud, and we also don't want a huge AWS bill at the, <laughs> at the end of the month. 
So um, proper configuration is uh, absolutely critical. And then of course, securing our backend resources. So if you do have a resource like a Dynamo table, or you have a resource like um, an RDS instance that you have to spin up for your service to function properly, if your entry point for your service and application to get into that database is, uh, is secure, but you haven't secured the resource itself, you're just going around the actual service. It's still a problem. So you have to uh, still maintain proper uh, encryption and security on those resources. Uh, uh, continue on through the uh, pipeline uh, component, there is compliance, uh, which assists in cost optimization so you don't have just an outrageous DynamoDB read and write, um, which has happened. Uh, so we check for those things. We also uh, can automate change control, which was a big, big win for us. So uh, we had a traditional uh, change control process that we really wanted to um, put together with our cloud strategy. And so through automation, we can now open and close changes and uh, escalate as necessary. Yes, I'm about to get right into that. Awesome. Thank you. So, and then of course, a big one for us is secrets and configuration management. There's a <laughs> ton of tools you could use for secrets and configuration management. And I'm gonna go over one very specific that we've built in house. And uh, we actually, we call it PSM, which is short for Parameter Store Manager. And uh, it's a security enabled simple REST service to manage application configuration in in AWS Parameter Store Manager. It allows for us to keep our secrets and our configuration in code in our repos in a secure way following our best practices and infrastructure's code best practices. So imagine with me, if you will, that you have a service that you're trying to deploy and you have specific configuration. Maybe you want to have your production uh, service be you know, scaled higher than your dev um, stage of that service. You can actually go in and configure that per stage and whenever it deploys using Parameter Store Manager or PSM and um, generates the CloudFormation under the hood, it'll get the correct values and deploy uh, with, the, with that configuration. Additionally, the service allows uh, secret management. So a lot of times we've run into issues where we want to enable our developers to go as fast as possible and to uh, have be as agile as possible, um, but they might not have the necessary ac uh, access in an account to deploy configuration or deploy a secret that we need in parameter store, which is our, our chosen secret store. So what do they have to do? They gotta put in a ticket, they gotta call someone, or they gotta get someone that has the access. But with PSM, we've enabled them to s store those secrets securely. So PSM is a, a REST service, you can feed it some data, it'll encrypt it for you, and now you can store it in, uh, as a ciphertext in your source control. Moving on in your pipeline, you can have an additional stage that would take that data, and if it sees the encrypted payload, decrypt it, and then push it to parameter store. So you can always have a specific configuration per stage, and you can even update your configuration without necessarily having or needing the access to the account. Um, it's, it's done great things for us. Uh, we went from developers waiting and having to get access that we don't necessarily want to give to they can update a value in the source control, do a pull request, and um, then there it is in the account once it's been done. So it's self-service. There's no elevated access, no more waiting, and of course it's, it's stored in source control. Um, here, here's an example. So imagine that you're calling an API and you um, use the, you know, your curl with post, and then it gives you a ciphertext back. Then in the next step in your pi uh, pipeline, you can feed it so, some JSON data and it'll crawl that. And even if it's got the ciphertext, it has access to decrypt and push that to parameter store. One of the cool things I really am proud of is uh, actually tagging. So there's a metadata section that would allow you to update a tag if you have to quickly do that. And then to call it, can you see the cursor? There it is. So to call it, you have um, in the serverless framework, it's a YAML file. You can actually call the value from parameter store and um, it pass that in even if it's a secret. So as you can see there, secret and at the end it says uh, decrypt equals true. 
And uh, just recently, this week, we open sourced it and pushed it out on GitHub. So uh, feel free to take a look at that, clone it, do a pull request, open an issue. Please be kind. Um, it's under the Neiman Marcus uh, GitHub page. And uh, it goes into some more details um, that I've done. So it has three functions, encrypt, which will encrypt a secret, It'll update, which will allow you to update the um, uh, update parameter store and then view. So you can actually view the configuration that's in parameter store. And if it sees that something is set as a uh, string secret, uh, string secret, it'll actually encrypt it again and give it back to you. So even you don't get to see it when you view. And then of course, there's this, um, I highly suggest on this service you put your own set of security on top of that, whether it be through limiting to IP address, needing additional API keys, um, or do maybe private endpoint. I uh, highly suggest that you do that, and, um, and it's, it's been a big win for us. So uh, let me get back here. Um, big picture for PSM, serverless enables agility and enables our developers to go fast, enables them to get code into an account as fast as possible. And how can we name that agility and enable security? I, I believe that it's a series of open source, but also custom tools and components that can be placed together within your workflow that's gonna enable both of those things. So PSM is just one component for secrets management, but maybe, maybe it's something else for you. Maybe it's not PSM, maybe uh, there's uh, additional problems and pain points that can be solved that can enable that security and also that agility. Um, now, with that said, this was a crawl, walk, run approach. It's, it was iterative. So it took us some time to get here. And um, for a initial win, for a big win for us, we had to have that foundation of security. And with that, to talk about some more, I'm gonna hand it over to Omar, who is our Security architect. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Clay. Uh, to give you the background, uh, we are a cloud AWS cloud shop, and we have almost ten to twelve AWS accounts, and uh, we have accounts based on the different lines of the uh, business in our enterprise. We have some for some for the analytics, where we run a huge data lake in S3. We have some for our e-commerce website and uh, uh, enterprise accounts for our legacy COTS applications. So as Heyman said, there are some founding principles like we encrypt everything. Uh, we don't differentiate between PII and non-PII data. So, uh, and uh, to counter the security governance and risk uh, and have a strategy in place, we use mix and match of uh, open source tools as well as third party tools. So. The first one here on the diagram is CloudSploit. It's basically uh, a security governance uh, monitoring tool uh, that actually uh, monitors the infrastructure uh, of AWS. Uh, and if any developer spins up an S3 bucket, which does not have server-side encryption enabled, or uh, spins up an EC2 uh, machine, which does not have encryption at the EBS, uh, we get real-time compliance for uh, these kind of vulnerabilities and uh, risks. And it also has got a lot of security best practices, which helps us to uh, maintain the uh, founding principles of the security, the best practice that we have at Neiman Marcus to comply with that. And it has got really cool tools as well. For example, as a part of our manual code review, we scan the cloud formation templates for any kind of vulnerabilities. Uh, if some developer is opening up uh, the EC2 machine, uh, the security groups to the world, we can actually f uh, figure it out that this is a vulnerability that needs to be fixed. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, like we use CloudSploit, which is a third party tool, we also heavily focus on open source tools. So for the real time compliance, uh, for the security and tagging, and particularly the cost control, we use an open source tool called Cap Cloud Custodian. It's an open source tool by uh, Capital One. Uh, it basically helps us uh, in the real time compliance of the resource spun up in cloud. As I said, cloud is elastic. Uh, you have resources being spun up uh, like anything by the developers, by the platform engineering teams. So to have a real, real strategy in place for the 
cost optimization, you need to start from day one. I mean, it can go really crazy uh, by the time you are into our third or sec fourth year of your cloud migration, and it really becomes a, a critical thing and forces the enterprises to uh, rethink uh, the strategy of whether they need to go remain in the cloud or not. So cloud, uh, so the cost uh, optimization is one of the biggest things. At Neiman Marcus, we use this tool, which is basically uh, nothing but Lambda rules, where you can dry run these policies and see what they can do. We turn off the resources. For example, as I said, we have 12 accounts uh, out of them, four or five are dev accounts where developers use them for the POCs, for the quick wins. So they keep these resources, say they spin up a M5X large machine, which costs you thousands, thousands of dollars. So we don't need them to be up and running on the weekends. So you can actually shut down these orphan resources and these unused resources. And also it helps with the tagging. Uh, for example, if uh, the platform engineering team spins up these infrastructure with, and does not tag them. Right, so it, you can have the real-time tagging applied to all the resources. And uh, I mean, feel free to go to the GitHub page and check out the rules, the Lambda rules, that you can customize as per your use cases in the company. Now, all these tools, uh, as I explained, uh, the open source and the third party is more of a reactive control setup. It, I can relate it to the diagram uh, by the little guy in the keynote where he showed devs, uh, uh, the DevSecOps engineers uh, clearing the clutter by the devs. So this is more of a reactive control and it's more of, in a traditional security, you can say it is uh, uh, the slap on the wrist and pat on the back. So you chase devs, you chase platform engineering teams to fix the encryption, to fix uh, the security groups open to the world. Now, how do you tackle this? Because as I said, cloud, it keeps growing. We, had, we started with two accounts, we are in, we have 12 accounts now. We have thousands of resources. So auto remediation is the next big thing in cloud. I mean, uh, for this, uh, at Neiman Marcus, this has been a big win for us because we had been chasing quite some time developers and the infrastructure guys uh, when they spin up these resources and asking them to fix these things. But with auto remediation, where at Neiman Marcus we are using two services, AWS native services. One is AWS config, that basically gives you the compliance uh, of the configurations of AWS, and also the SSM, AWS Systems Manager. It helps you to automate uh, the operational task of AWS. So if a developer, even if he's not following pipeline, he's doing it as a part of his POC, does not put encryption on S3 bucket. The AWS config uh, uh, runs the compliance check of that configuration and then SSM automation kicks in and puts the server side encryption on the S3 bucket. So you don't need a lot of security guys chasing up and actually helps you a lot in the longer run. And it can also, uh, there are very few services that are being supported right now, particularly from the S3 and e EC2 instances. You can actually put bucket versioning and also bucket logging. So from the PII, PCI perspective, you are kind of covered of, for all these risks. So everyone talked about uh, here about the intelligent threat intelligence platform that we have. Uh, we, at Neiman Marcus, we are utilizing God Duty. It's basically an AI ML uh, setup where you can leverage the machine learning, uh, uh, machine learning capability of this tool. So it has got some detection patterns uh, for the Bitcoin mining, for the cryptocurrency, if someone is trying to compromise your EC2 instance. And you can actually, uh, it basically uh, looks up the network key logs, like DNS logs, VPC flow logs and then uh, identifies if there's any kind of anomaly uh, from, the, uh, from your usual pattern. For example, I logged into our account right now at AWS and I got an alert to the SecOps Slack channel that I have logged in from this location, which is unusual. So it helps us to kind of tackle such kind of risk. And we can actually filter out, like we say, the noise, the false positives, with uh, uh, identifying this risk as high, medium, and low, and then you can send them to your usual channels uh, for uh, like SIEM and uh, uh, Slack monitoring channels. Now, how do you tie this, uh, all these things? I mean, you have a lot of tools. I mean, you have a lot of third-party tools, open source tools. You do a lot of uh, customization in these tools. How do you take all these tools and then have a single pane of glass? Because like I said, there are 12 accounts. You cannot go into each account and look for the security vulnerabilities you need to have some kind of a foundation for your incidence response, wherein you send these logs of all these security tools to a Lambda engine where you can do some remediation 
or you can actually filter out these false positives and send them to say SIEM or your uh, Slack channels. So this helps us to set a foundation for the instance response for the forensics. If anything goes bad, then actually we can have a single pane of glass to see what are the threats uh, or adversaries, internal, external. So uh, I would like Heyman to take the last two slides to uh, uh, kind of conclude this and make sense of how we tie both things together. Thank you, Omar. So as I said, uh, those three pillars I mentioned, architecture, uh, your uh, organization, and the tools, to all three, like a, a classic football an analogy, right? Uh, offense, defense, and special teams uh, are, are equally responsible. You can't just do one thing and say, I'm doing DevSecOps, uh, it won't work. You ha all three have to be uh, working in cohesion uh, to make it work. And then uh, remember, again, it's not a sprint, uh, do this iteratively. You don't have to solve everything day one uh, and be perfect. Uh, you move uh, uh, different product teams maybe at different levels of maturity. Uh, so you have to adjust uh, your model to adjust for the velocity or the maturity of the team and be uh, able to iterate through. And uh, security is a constantly, uh, I don't, everybody knows this, but it's a constantly evolving uh, uh, situation and we have to be, come back and constantly reevaluate everything uh, we've done. So that's it for now. Uh, any questions? No? All right, thank you. Thank you.